people in the audience that I recognize, so the train is ready to leave the station. I recognize a lot of historians, Hog Island residents, some that I don't, but hope that I will. I want to thank you for coming. This is a special program, one I wanted to put on for several years, but never quite had the courage. It takes a lot of research and a lot of collecting and stuff, and I still don't have everything that I thought I needed, and I certainly don't have the memory that I need to share it all with you. So I'm going to have to refer to notes. I'm Ron Kilburn, president of the Swanton Historical Society. I live in Swanton, the other part. This is the main part here. This is West Swanton. This is Hog Island. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, thanks to uh, Northwest Access Television, this will be video so that you can watch it on the channel if you don't see or hear enough today. And if you have to stand outside, I apologize. But uh, in my years of giving programs for the Swan Historical Society with help from folks there, uh, we put on a lot of interesting programs, but never one that had to turn people away because you had too little room. But I thought this would be the perfect place to do this program. So without any delay, I'm going to uh, explain what's going on. Um, a lot of this stuff comes from two important books that you should know about. <coughs> the first and oldest one is The History of the Town of Swanton, Perry and Barney, published in 1882. <coughs> the most recent one is published by the Swanton Historical Society, uh, Rod Ledoux, the author. And this was published in uh, 1987. So, history, as you know, depends a lot on the written word. But did you know that the written word comes from the oral word that people who are observing and remembering and tell someone who puts it down and it ends up in books like that? Or it ends up in the collective memory and it gets passed on from generation to generation. I'm going to be showing you some photographs that you might not have seen before, and some that you might have, and some of them which explain themselves without any comment, and some which don't. And most of them, as I say, are black and white, and they're the older vintage. But I'm going to start out with this, which is a product of modern technology, to explain a little bit about how things have changed, and also to uh, remind you of what a special place West Swanton, Hog Island, really is. So those of you who live in the village, the village, I should remember, I should remind you that part of the title to this program, besides being the history of Hog Island, is what's in a name. So I'm going to focus first on what's in a name, to some extent. Now when they were naming this part of Swanton, which is now Swanton Village, was at one time Takwahunga Falls, because of the dam. Uh, it was also, um, oh help me somebody, it's had a number of names through the years, oh yes. The earliest name, perhaps, was Missisquoi Village. That's M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-Q-U-E, an Abenaki name, Missisquoi Village. And the most recent name, the one that we utilize uh, at the moment, is Swanton Village, and that's because it reflects the incorporation of our village in uh, 1888. But what I'm really talking about is less about Swanton Village and more about the natural features that define our community, both here and as you travel down the Missisquoi, around the bend, and down over here, and work your way past the former refuge headquarters, and you get out here getting deeper and deeper to Hog Island, <coughs> and getting closer and closer to Campbell Bay, and working your way around here, 
And if you keep going, you if you don't take the bridge, you'll end up in the lake right here. And this, of course, you know, is the Cisco Bay. And this is how it looks from the air uh, on, a day, on a day like today, a clear day, a clear sunny day. But what you see is water really defines our community. And because of that, it defines our heritage. And it defines how people used to live, work, play. Water seemed to affect everything. Whether it was transportation, how do you get from here on this side of the lake across to Albert? Well, you only have two choices, I guess. You have the ferry back then, or you had to wait till the water froze to ice and you could drive over. So water really limited what you could do in terms of transportation or travel. But water also assisted the things you could do because it helped to produce electricity. And the electricity, of course, was what powers uh, many homesteads then and now. So we'll go a little bit back in time. I'm going to start with the last picture on the list, which is really first and foremost uh, today. This little special church, the little white church, the Methodist Chapel in West Swanton, Vermont. And there it is. Let's talk a little bit about it. This church was uh, constructed around 1891, and it's on the uh, State Register of Historic Places. And the nomination form and the narrative about the church, which was uh, uh, written in this, this nomination in 1982, says the following. This eclectic style church was placed on the state register of this historic places in 1982. It is described as small rural <clears throat> vernacular church showing no strong stylistic tendencies an open belfry with bell, and original deacon benches in the interior. Further, quoting, This is a good example of rural church, largely unaltered and still in use. Built in the late 19th century, the church does not follow any particular style, but has a simple massing of New England meeting houses. It is notable for its petite picturesqueness and its original fabric. Now, a note from the History of Swan, 1988, by Rodney Ledoux, quote, reads as follows. By the way, can you all hear me okay with this? Yeah. <clears throat> Everett Douglas lived next to the Little White Methodist Church, which he tended for over 30 years. The poet Robert Frost came several times to visit this church. Here were men of two different worlds. Both of them found peace not only in church, but in nature itself. These men are no longer with us. But yet, when we're out on the lake on a beautiful day, we may feel that the guide, and that was Everett, the poet, and that was Frost, or God himself is looking down on us, telling us to appreciate this land that came to us so easily, but required many years of backbreaking labor by our forefathers so that we could just be here to enjoy it. Says in the official document, the building seats about 70 people. Does it? <laughs> in June 1949, the bell was taken from the Swanton Public School, which is now the town hall, and was erected in the belfry of the church. It just says, by some of the people of West Swanton. Well, they didn't identify, didn't identify those people who stole the bell from town hall. <laughs> But the statute of limitations would prevent any prosecution today. So, regarding the church, are there any parishioners here or anyone else who have any stories or wisdom that you wish to share about the building or the church itself at this time? Give me a little break. Okay.
So a part of the title of this program is uh, Hog Island, and the reflection on Hog Island is uh, what's in a name. And so we've already defined one thing that's in the name, Hog Island, is its uh, presence uh, surrounded by water for the most part. And the other thing that's in the name, of course, is hog. And let me see what the historians have to say about that. It's said that there's a map on the wall of the town clerk's office in Swanton, compiled by the selectmen in 1910, shows the northern end of Swanton as, quote, Pleasure Island, a euphemism for what the natives have always called Hog Island. The island was formed by Maquam Creek, which ran from the Missisquoi River to Lake Champlain on Maquam shore. The creek was located just north of the headquarters of the former National Wildlife Refuge at that location. In the early days, people would drive their hogs to the island, where they would remain for the season, to be fattened by eating butternuts, beech nuts, walnuts, and acorns, which were plentiful. The hogs were probably marked so that they could be identified when rounded up in the fall. The Reverend John Perry, who wrote the early history of Swan, considered Hog Island a vulgar name, but most of the people who live there don't consider it as such, do you? No. Good. <laughs> a couple of other things notable about Hog Island and the name and what's in it. Uh, historically speaking, on September 24th, 1834, a petition from Hog Island to be set off from Swanton and Highgate to form a new town called Marshfield. That contained 47 names on the petition. It never happened. <laughs> But what did happen was that on November 3rd, 1836, the northern part of Hog Island, which was part of Highgate, sorry guys from Highgate that are here today, it was annexed to Swanton. And as I recall, it was not annexed uh, without a struggle. And in 1821, just a few years previous, John Hilliker, his son John and nephews George and William Hilliker and 28 others petitioned the Vermont State Legislature to set off Hog Island from Highgate and Swanton and incorporate it to be known and called the name of Elizabethtown. They did this because the island, quote, was so situated that a passage from the mainland is always attended with difficulty and at certain seasons of the year wholly impossible. Now, you can picture that, perhaps, but remember, this is in 1821. They're describing what was going on. And of course, there were times in more recent years, perhaps in 2011, when the lake was so high, in fact, it was at its highest, there were times where you just couldn't get to parts of Hog Island, even in recent times. Can't get there from here, they say. I'm looking for my most important document, but uh, it's here somewhere. Just a moment. I told you. 
<laughs> so, let's move on. Unless there's somebody who wants to offer another name that people had conjured up in the back times of the Four Bears and wherever. Anybody got any other names for Hog Island? Okay. So we'll go forward. Ron, can you explain why anybody <coughs> chose Elizabeth for this name? This on, 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 on. Can I? Can I what? Can you explain why anybody chose that name, Elizabeth? Oh, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an odd name. <laughs> oh yeah, but it's a nice name, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, so talking about water, talking about transportation, how do you get there from here? If you're in West Swan or Hog Island and you want to get to Albert, wouldn't it awfully be an awful nice to have a bridge? Well, this shows the construction of a bridge. It's an amazing photograph. Uh, I'm so glad we have it. In fact, uh, it's so attractive, the uh, Vermont Maritime Museum wanted to have copies and we share copies with them. But this shows the construction of the, the bridge. And you can zoom in on it. Some guys are in their working clothes. Some guys are all dressed up. Must be a boss, huh? <coughs> and some guys aren't sitting up straight or standing. Looks like you're taking a noonday snooze. And if you look over here, you look what seems to be some size apparatus to probably operate a pump for air so divers could go down and work. Now what I'm not totally sure of, and maybe you folks can uh, answer the question for me, it seems to me this equipment and all of the activity is a little too early for construction of the bridge itself in uh, 1938. I think it's more likely to be the construction of the trestle for the train that ran across from Swanton to East Elbert. That's what I think. But I don't know. Anybody know? Yeah, looks like pile driving. Yeah. Looks like that, doesn't it? Yeah. What year was it originally? And here's a guy that's hard at work, he's got his full business attire on. He's probably checking to make sure everybody's busy, right? <laughs> oh, that could be. So, let me go back one. This is after the trestle was completed. And you see the train headed towards um, Sandy Point, West Swanton. This is right near the Niles Farm, which later became the Carmen Farm. And you see a little bit of steam there, probably not going that fast, but there's not much of a full load either. And it's going to go right by this, the West Station, which was also on the Niles Farm. And aren't we lucky? There's John Niles. Uh, John Niles was grandfather of someone some of you may have known, and that's John Carmen. And they had a wonderful personal and working relationship. And John uh, inherited a lot of acreage, prime property there on the shore in West Swanton, Hog Island. And he uh, looks like he's been hard at work doing something, because you're going to see another picture of him. He's also 
doing something, but he's superintending other people doing the work because of all that he knows about construction and about walleye or pike perk fishing. Does, pike it, perk does it say Leafwood on his building, Ron? It did. So. Not now, though. And there, all the work that went into that trestle, and look what happened. Mm. It burned. Those are the melted rails. But the good news is, there's a building out here for the bridge tender. It looks like it didn't burn. It looks like it escaped the flames. Every year was that on? I don't know. Don't ask me years, please. <laughs> Google it. There's a, a rumor that, the watch, <coughs> that there was a watchman in that building but that he was fell asleep. Is that true? They told me, the guy in the front row here, that there was a watchman in that building and he fell asleep. God hadn't heard that one. So here they are, they're repairing it after it had burned. They're replacing the pilings in this structure. Look at that crane, it's uh, blowing smoke. Must be steam. Coal driven. Oops, okay. We're gonna talk about schools. Now you can talk about schools and uh, Hog Island, that portion of Swanton, was uh, a large area geographically, but didn't have a whole lot of people. But here's a whole lot of them at the school, all dressed up. And it looks to me, but correct me again if I'm wrong, it looks to me like it's uh, the North School, which would be on the corner of uh, what is now Route 78, I believe and the road out in front of the church. I believe that, but I'm not certain. I believe this is the North School. There were only two. And the next picture, I believe, is the South School, which was on Tabor Road, uh, further on down near the cemetery. But again, I don't know, I wasn't there. Anybody know? Yeah. Ready, did you go to school there? That first one you showed, uh... That school was located over here on the church road where one of the Chini girls on the Chini farm okay. right on the knoll before you got to uh, the Camel Bay Road. Well, thank the you. Camel Bay Road and the, yeah. the church road here. I appreciate that. That was the first one. Was that near the cemetery? Pardon? Was that near the cemetery? No. No. Church, just right up over here. Okay. Was, that, was that here? No, no, no. Yeah. no on, this was prior. This was the main road here before this 78 never came in until about 1936, the year they built the bridge. Okay. Prior to that, there was a ferry there, Poisson Ferry. But this was the main highway here that turned at Charcoal Creek. It was 104 at that time, and then it would come up to the first turn here to the on the church road, and the first knoll where the houses are up there now is where that school was on the on the south side of that knoll. This one here. That's it. There, yeah. It's probably some of my uh, <laughs> older family. I'm not in that one, but I've got a couple brothers and uh, sisters of Campbells. There's other people here on shore. That, got descendants from there uh, at, at that school. Already, I'm so glad you're here today because you could provide that kind of information. The district school, and I think it was closed in 1940 or 39. Was it known as number 11 or 15, do you know? 15. 15, thank the, you. The number, district? The number no, the number. The number of the school. That sounds like 11, I think. Seems to me it was District 11. Okay, we got an argument. That's what I was hoping. We got an 11 and 15 there. <laughs> what am I bid? Ron, it's called the Old River Road. You see that? What'd you say? It was called the Old River Road. This road. Old, old, old River Road. A long, long, long time ago. We had some documentation on it. I don't doubt it. Good. So, um, well, that's good to know. Thank you. 
So where was this one? That's what they call the South End, South Island. There was another school in Hog Island. Yep. There were two district schools. This one was here, uh, down on the Tabor Road, next to that small cemetery. The cemetery that's still available today? The cemetery is still there with mm -hmm. you in this. But it was on that same side of the road. Well, I trust this information. I was given information by a reliable source that told me the other school was this building out here. But uh, there we go. We'll, we'll put that to rest. Thank you. Let's move on. Why is the land up here? Okay. Turkeys. I know that's a Donaldson. I just don't know which one. Anybody know which one? Claude? Claude Donaldson. Yeah. Claude Donaldson? Okay, thank you. I guess it's time to talk turkey. topic of turkeys uh, later on when we have some other interesting photographs. But just right now, we have Mr. Donaldson out there as a principal participant in turkey raising. Uh, we should talk a little bit about turkeys themselves. So let me see what I can find here. And this is from the, uh, the uh, Ledoux uh, History of Swanton. And I'm reading from it, so I will read what it says. Just remember, this is now in 1987 that this is being reported. It is said that the early days, turkeys were driven to the markets in Boston, that their feet were dipped in tar, then placed in sand to protect them from the long trip. <laughs> so... Would, would you buy land in Florida from a fellow who told you that? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's true. But it sounds highly improbable. But boy, this is folklore. This is what is really fun about history. I'll repeat. It's said that in the early days, turkeys were driven to the markets in Boston, that their feet were dipped in tar, then placed in sand to protect them from the long trip, and that at night they would roost in the trees. However, we do not know if the people of Swanton did this. We do know, however, that many of them made a livelihood raising turkeys over the years. Well, Rennie, your brother told me they used to do that for the turkeys. Yeah, but I don't know. That's okay. I don't know about driving them to Boston. I doubt it. <laughs> but, uh, you think they might have gone to Philadelphia? <laughs> this Claude Donaldson was probably the more or less the introducer of the raising turkeys on Hog Island here. Mm -hmm. He was one of the early ones. And uh, the different farms would raise uh, a few turkeys and they would drive them down to the Donaldson farm here where they, the groups would be picking them, you know, uh, uh, slaughtering them, in other words, dressing them. And they would be driven up the road and us kids would all participate in the drive, they were drove like cattle, only they were turkeys. Was it fun? A few of them got away now and then. <laughs> <laughs> now, would this be the Donaldson Farm that is now where the uh, Refuge Headquarters building is? Oh, and that now. Is this where the yeah. Refuge Headquarters building is now, that farm? Yes, it is. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thought so. I need to get that. All right, we got the answer. Right. So, it says here. Yes, yes. Thanks. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> E.S. Tabor began raising turkeys more than 100 years ago. And the Tabor family continued raising turkeys for many years. The New England Homestead Magazine, printed in Springfield, Massachusetts, on November 24, 1928, featured a story about Milton Burt Tabor. Their farm in the southern part of Hog Island, with its three miles of shoreline, made an ideal place to raise turkeys. At first, the turkeys depended solely upon natural food, such as grasshoppers and other insects. 
The operation gradually grew into a sophisticated agricultural endeavor. The old hens were kept over and used for breeding, along with the younger ones. And about 10 tons and 150 hens were wintered each year, up until around 1926. The mother hens <coughs> raised their own turkeys. And then Mr. Tabor started experimenting with brooders. And when asked how he controlled disease, he replied, quote, it's a long story, but the most important thing to remember is that cleanliness is over half the battle. <laughs> Besides losing birds to disease, many were stolen. So it was necessary to keep a man on looking near the turkey roost at night, on lookout. Now Bob Bushy was 70 when he reminisced about West Swanton and the turkeys. Bob had been taking care of turkeys ever since he was six years old, when he lived on the old James Madison Tabor farm that was later owned by the Colgans. Bob worked at the missile base for a couple of years, and during that time, his wife, Geraldine, oversaw the turkey operation. Milton Tabor told Bob that at one time he raised turkeys on Butler's Island. They just brought the turkeys over to the island and let them go. All the farmers would get together and plant a field of buckwheat for the turkeys to feed on. And in the fall, they would spread corn to attract the turkeys. And then they would corner them and sort them out. Each farmer had a mark, like a brand, you know, such as cutting off a certain toe from the turkeys. <laughs> Yeah. So they could tell it was theirs. How many, how many toes on a turkey anyway? <laughs> Anybody know? Give me a guess. Okay. So, um, so they could tell which one was theirs, it says. And after they caught the birds, they'd bring them to their rightful owners. And then they would feed them corn for a couple of weeks to fatten them up before they sold them. Around 1925, farmers started getting into the turkey business in a big way. Most of them were on Hog Island. Maybe it should have been renamed Turkey Island. They built brewer houses 14 feet square with a lean-to attached at one end. And Bob Bushy figured about 75,000 turkeys were raised per year in Swanton. The breakdown would be approximately as follows. This fellow must have had one heck of a memory. But anyway, Milton Tabor raised 45,000 at his Lakeshore turkey farm on Tabor's Point in West Swanton. Bob Bushy was next with 14,000. 4,000 at his farm on the St. Albans Road at the corner of Woods Hill. And the balance raised for him by Ozzie Martin. Guy we met, Mrs. Walter Fadden, Mr. Schoolcraft, and Carlton Donaldson. Eddie Dixon, 3,500, a 30 pound tom turkey from Ed Dixon's farm was presented to Steve Allen on his TV program. <laughs> Do you remember that? Well, they raised 153 pounds. <laughs> now also went on TV. Wow, how about that? That is a lot of <laughs> I knew once we got away from the subject of churches and talking about turkeys, it would draw more interest. So, Claude Donaldson, 25, excuse me, 1500, Ralph Bushy, 1500, John Carmen, 1500, Buster Cassavoy, 1500, Raymond Hubbard, 1500, Lewis Young, a thousand, Royal Bushy, a thousand, Wesley Decker, a thousand, Albert Morrow, a thousand, Albert Bushy, eight hundred in East Swanton, and Stanley Hilliker, five hundred. Euclid Duhamel and others that he could not recall raised lesser amounts. Now, here's what's great about interviewing people for a story about history. And to find someone like this who has this kind of information and can draw it out and share it with you is just so important. That was Bob Bushy. Stanley Hilliker was the first one to raise white turkeys. And later, most of the farmers ended up raising them. Most of the turkeys were sold to the New York and Boston markets and were shipped in barrels via overnight refrigerated trucks. 
They got six to eight tom turkeys and 10 to 12 hen turkeys in a barrel. <laughs> Boy, does, does that sound like the makings of a joke, huh? Well, anyway, uh, Grace Donaldson Babarji said that her mother, Glenn, Glenna Donaldson, was the one that started raising turkeys in their family. Her father, Claude, who we referred to earlier, got into it as a sideline when he retired from the Central Vermont Railroad. He spent more time in his farm raising a strain of broad-breasted bronze turkeys, and he had a flock of 250 breeders. So Claude Donaldson, here we are, we're back now to the, to the picture. Uh, Claude Donaldson, Elmwood Farm. Donaldson is believed to have been the first New England turkey breeder to build a breeder house using wood slats for the floor of the house, as well as the porch. These houses were 30 by 30 with a 30 foot by 16 foot porch. The poults were reared on porches for 10 to 12 weeks and then put out on the range. At one time, Mr. Donaldson was president of the Vermont Turkey Growers Association, which had 100 members, and Wilfred Forty worked for him. And Mr. Donaldson had a dog trained to round up the turkeys for him. Around 1970, the federal government required that turkeys that were to be shipped out of the state, and most of them were, be butchered in a slaughterhouse under government inspection. Now, doesn't that just sound like your government? Ruining a good thing, but with good intentions, sure. We wanted everybody to stay healthy. So now, and this is in 1988, only about 15,000 turkeys are grown in the whole state, and none in Swanton. Okay. Okay, this, I'm told, is an 1871 map of Hog Island. Now, <clears throat> don't you also wonder why it was never named Goat Island? Look at, look at that profile. Is it chin whiskers? <laughs> <laughs> but this shows you where the families uh, settled, and it shows you that this part of the, of the island was predominantly Tabor. And you've got the prime landowners around the edges here that own lakefront property. And you can see the railroads going through at this time, but probably little else in terms of uh, transportation. And this is the so-called north end of the island where you've got, of course, Campbell's Bay and Pickle Point and uh, Sandy Point, whatever. So you've got all your points and you've got uh, the different parts of the island, so-called, that are on the river. But at a time where it was not too heavily populated, even then. And this is just offered to show how Swanton and Highgate relate to each other in a single map. So here you've got the Missisquoi, which separates Highgate from Swanton back then. And I believe the annex part, the annexation, lopped off a piece of this to go with Swanton from Highgate. And you've got uh, Gander Bay and Goose Bay. And you've got Highgate Center and so on. And this is an even older map, which is harder to read but it does show the, uh, the settlement of the village and the squares that are uh, formed here to show the settlement pattern in the village of Swanton. Nothing to do with Hog Island, but just to, to let you know, that we're fortunate to have a map under glass at the uh, Historical Society, which is dated 1824, and which uh, shows what each numbered block on this here. Yeah. Uh, represents. This is uh, in the village. 
So just putting in a plug for your historical society as being a great resource for, <coughs> for uh, history in photographs, uh, in artifacts, in uh, who knows what. Iran. But the people who can tell you what are here. There's uh, Linda Kelly, who's the curator, and Fran Hopkins here, who's also assisting on the job. And they keep things, uh, they keep track of things so that we can find them when we need them. And so I'm indebted to them for having found so much stuff about West Swanton. Now, yeah, Tim, did you have something? Yeah, put your cursor back down to the creek there, uh, McQuong Creek. Keep coming back down. Keep right, a little bit more. See that creek right there? Not the dead end one. That's first creek and the second one. I was told that from McQuong Creek to the left is originally Hog Island. That was a waterway over the river. That's where Hog Island begins, just past the old government building where it connected to the river. That's right. So, who told you that? Well, it's not hard to figure out. <laughs> it's just a, it's a, it was a waterway until they blocked it off and made the, the highway and the railroad in Maquam Bay. So they filled it in, and then they filled it in over when they put the highway in. So then you couldn't get, then it wasn't, uh, I don't know where you want to draw the line. I, 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 That's what I was told. I don't, I don't <laughs> doubt it, Tim. Yeah. I, You're right. I'm just wondering. Randy, Randy, oh, Randy right. told you, okay. Yeah, he's right. There, there, was, an alternate, there was an alternate road to Hog Island. You go down the Tabor Road here, mm -hmm. and then bring it right over to uh, Lake Street in Swanton. There was a bridge there. I know, I rode oh, horses right. over it. It's called down. the Black Bridge. It's like the Black Bridge or the, the, the Trundling Bridge. Okay. Thank you for that information. So we gotta have a welcome to Hog Island sign, Ron. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so there's that uh, Rhode Island picture again. <coughs> which is really Hog Island. But this shows it in context with all of the land around it uh, from Grand Isle too. And you can see where uh, Hog Island fits into the big picture. And this looks like it's a map that was prepared more recently for uh, tourist purposes because it does show sites for uh, certain outdoor activity. Uh, Champlain Valley Campground, for example, North Hero State Park, North Hero State Park, uh, a lot of other stuff. This is quite a national wildlife refuge up here. And that's a big block of territory here. This is quite 65,000 acres, can you believe it? Or is it 6,500? 6,500. That's better. They got an out, Ron, don't you Taxes, taxes just went down. <laughs> Okay, you've heard of Sandy Point. We mentioned it just briefly in passing about how West Swanton is situated, but a lot of activity here. At, uh, in 1891, This shows Sandy Point, and it also shows the sail ferry that went from Sandy Point over to uh, East Albert. I don't know if it was during the time that uh, the Blair, Blair family operated it or not, but you can see it here, the sail ferry, and also you can see the trestle for the train bridge. And let's see if there's any activity on shore. Uh, doesn't appear to be at that time. Well, if anything at all, it would be the fish hatchery. But I think this predated that. <coughs> so here we are. 
Uh, this, I believe, would be also Sandy Point because there's the island up there. I don't know what they call that island. Do you folks, anybody? Steve, do you know? What do they call that island, that little one? Lilies Island. Lilies Island. Lilies? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> 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 So here we are. Uh, we've got the sail ferry again, uh, departing to head over to East Albert, presumably, at some time. And in the background, we've got the uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, Hatchery building. And we've got what looks like a capture boat that was used by the refuge to capture the fish so that they could get the eggs, strip them, and then send the uh, fish back into the lake to spawn some more. But this is an important part of your history here in Hog Island, the hatchery. Now, compared to the wildlife refuge, which is 6,500 acres in size, this little place, which had so much activity, is only two acres. I'll tell you later on what happened so that our efforts to save the hatchery buildings did not materialize, but we're not there yet. Here's a little close-up of the ferry. There's the ramp to get up on there, and you'll notice here, this time, we've got wagons and horses, which tells me that's a much earlier photo than some of the others I'm going to show you, but the quality is really something, isn't it? As I look around, try to figure out who's in charge, I can't tell if it's this fella or this fella, or this fella. Probably not that one. That's a woman. Probably not that one. This one, he's got long pants with uh, suspenders, so he's, uh, he's probably in charge. And it looks like this is a reel that uh, carried the uh, cable this, was this a combination cable and sail ferry? Did it have the two features, do you know? I would think so. What would they do with a blue cable across if they didn't have the wind? That's what I was thinking. Yep. <laughs> and here's just another uh, interesting picture showing more of the same. But you know, I don't know about you folks, but I, I have a fascination with the concept of fairies, especially when we think about how we can get around so easily today. The only impediment we sometimes have to get across water today is you have to pay a toll occasionally. But in these days, uh, you couldn't get there from here without this device if it wasn't wintertime and the ice frozen. There was no other way to get across the pond there. which may have been a better time, actually. But we won't uh, reminisce. So this is 1920, showing the ferry operating from Swanton to Albert, owned and operated by Stanley Blair. Now, this is a more recent photo, because you see not wagons and horses, but we've got buggies, we've got cars, and we've got quite a few of them, too, it looks like. How many uh, cars and buggies we got on there, anyway? Four. Four? That's probably capacity, huh? I would think. Now, four men in a boat. Rub-a-dub-tub. This is uh, picture number 21. This is a steam-powered boat, four men, and Florence. Anybody know who Florence was? My Uncle Peter's wife. <laughs> 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 Does this refer to her? No. <laughs> Steve, I was wondering if this was, it had anything to do with Everett Douglas, and if you know. I think it was before his time. Before his time? Okay. 
But anyway, it's uh, purported to be off the shore here in uh, Hog Island. Steam driven. Look at that. Isn't that something? And look at how dressed up they are, too. Got a straw hat, a tie. <laughs> now, this is a uh, typical Hog Island resort. This is a log cabin. There were a few of them here, I'm told. I don't think this is the one that now belongs to uh, Becky and uh, Becky Rope and husband, but it might be. I just don't know. Anybody know which uh, log cabin this one was? Probably one down on Fadden Road. On Fadden Road. <coughs> could be one. It could be where uh, Ed, uh, Ned Spear lives too. That was log cabin originally. Yeah. And then there was another one here. It's still here at the Four Corners. <coughs> The old Marcus place, right over here, coming on to off in '78. That house there was originally log. Any guesstimate as to how many log cabins there were at uh, one time? How many log cabins? Yeah, at one time. Well, we uh, there's an old map. We got a 27 map to home, and I I think there was three. Uh, one of them existed up where on the on the farm. At the home farm, the girls' farm? farm, way down mm -hmm. on the lake. Mm -hmm. And then the next one was over here at the McFadden, uh, Fadden's old place, uh, uh, here at uh, Walter, Walter, uh, George Sheets, well, it was a Sheets family. Mm -hmm. And this one here is the one that's located. It's, they're all, you know, dots where there were cabins, but okay. there's at least three of them. So list, uh, it well, looks like Lake in the background, well, and that would be bad, or possibly that, Ned's. That could have been. It could be that. Charcoal Creek, because there's nothing back there. Yeah, it could have been one or the other, of course. They, you know, they've been renovated so many times. Yeah. So, you know, we, we know there's a written record somewhere that explains this, uh, its location and everything else, but it is so much uh, more helpful to have people like you folks tell us what you know about it. And uh, again, I, I'm thankful for that. So back to the farm, the Donaldson farm, and the turkeys. <coughs> we talked a lot about them, and now I'm going to show you some photographs about them. And some of them are interesting. You've probably seen them before, but they're still interesting. So I think this is Claude here, surveying his brood. And look at this. <laughs> look at this. He knows what's going to happen to them, doesn't he? <laughs> he's, he's, he's so sad. And then what he's saying, what he's saying to himself, though, with all these birds around him, is, "How did I get here?" <laughs> this was, uh, on, I'm told, on Albert Bombardier's farm. And that this might just be. Um, Actually, excuse me, that's Albert Bombardier, it says here. What's he got on his t-shirt here? Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Okay. Now, this is a little girl, an unidentified bird. And she's lamenting its condition. <laughs> and she may be, they say, uh, Loretta Fortier, or Fortier, whichever. But that's Loretta, and I think she's sort of wondering, uh, how come I'm sitting here <laughs> watching this thing happen? Look at the ribbon. And she's saying, oh my, oh my, I, when I knew him before. Uh, this now, uh, 
I'm told, but I don't know. Do they call it a traverse that's being pulled there? No, it's a What's it called? I think it's a dray. Dray, D-R-E-Y? Yeah, okay. Well, this, I'm told, is on a sheets farm, and it's obviously in the wintertime. Maybe you folks, some of you can identify us. Is that your grandfather? I, I think it's my great grandfather. Really? Yeah. 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 I think it's his name, though. Is he sheep? Sheets, yes. Yeah. Some of the early settlers. Yeah. Sheets. All right. He, he died pretty young. And then my grandmother farmed that alone while with my grandfather for quite a while. <coughs> Not straight across from Randy's farm, where California lives now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Now, I'm told. I don't know what you call a device. I'd call it a two-horse planter, but I don't know what you call it. What do you call it? Grain drill. Grain drill? Yeah. Cool. Can you get one of these at Farniers? Probably won't have the spoke wheel. It doesn't say who. I can tell you who it is. Good, good. Somebody take notes here. Zoom in, zoom in, Bob. Is that you? No, I, the uh, gentleman standing there is uh, what it was William Cheney. Mm -hmm. Gordon Cheney's dad. Okay. And I don't know, it must be one of his children. And I'm almost sure that was done when he was working for my father at that time. I think that's it, back at the farm. That, and that had to be in the 30s. I remember that photo. You know, all the little photos hanging around. Good. So, whoever took notes, you want to get them to me so I can caption this picture. Good. Okay, now you can get one of these, I know, at the farm auction next spring. That one there, I think. What's the what's the manufacturer? Do you know? Forrester. Forrester. No, Forrester. Oh, Forrester. 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 Okay. And what year would you say this was? That had to be that was had to be in the early thirties, mm -hmm. about thirty one, thirty two, I think they came out. And uh, the only other tractors was this Tabor, this Milton Tabor, I think. He was a case. He had case tractors. Do you recommend this one? <laughs> what was that? No. Do you recommend that type of tractor? Well, they, they had a long ways to go. When they, <laughs> when they made that one, they did that. <laughs> So here's a quiz for you. Why is this picture of the Barney Marble Works down near the dam in the village in the Hog Island presentation? I know some of you know that. Don't you? But keep trying. What the heck? <laughs> this is just another example of how Swanton Village is connected to Hog Island in a different way. 
We're connected because we have the Masisquoi, of course, you know that. But we're also connected because the present, the present day fish hatchery, if you go look at it, you'll see in the cornerstone 1916. But really, it existed before 1916 because it was up here, right there in the village. That's the old hatchery building. It was disassembled board by board, loaded onto wagons, and driven out to Sandy Point and reconstructed out there. So don't trust the marker, the marker on the building today that says 1916. That's just the year of arrival. It was constructed and deconstructed much earlier. But you know, it's a substantial structure. I mean, look at what it would have taken to deconstruct that and reconstruct it. But, you know, it's all owned by the government and not the state government. So there it was, and now I'm going to tell you later where it is. And you'll see the similarity. So speaking of where it is, and having spoken of John Niles, here he is. He's the superintendent of the hatchery that was relocated uh, from the river close to the dam down to this location here on Sandy Point. This is a 1920 photograph. And it shows John Niles, the superintendent. Now, the last picture you saw of John Niles, he was standing on the railroad tracks in his work clothes. But now, look how uh, progress, progress has left its mark on him. Isn't that interesting? All dressed up. He's supervising these guys who are installing the fish pins by driving stakes into the ground so they can be filled with water and the fish can be released into these pins. You see, there's one wall of the pin, there's the other, and this guy's standing in the middle. And you've got the Niles farm over here, and you've got the, uh, the trestle going across, and you've got more guys here, uh, you know, they're not working so hard that they can't stop and pose for the photograph, which is good. We like to see these guys in pictures so we can identify them. Anybody know who he is? Who he is? <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> Anybody know what they call this building here, which is uh, used as a bunkhouse? Anybody recall? Does it look at all like the Hotel Vermont? That's what they called it, Hotel Vermont. Yeah. It's no longer standing, of course, it was demolished years ago, but this is a part of your fish hatchery out here. Now here's John Niles again with his grandson, John Carmen. And there's the U.S. fisheries boat that was used, I, I suspect, to, uh, to uh, disperse and retrieve the fish seines from the, from the lake. But there they are standing uh, probably on, on the Niles property or on the hatchery property, one or the other. So, fast forward a little bit. The building got moved out from the village, reconstructed here on Sandy Point, and there it is. And there's uh, Mr. Niles again. John Niles, and there's John Carmen, his grandson, all grown up. In the previous picture where he was uh, standing on the boat in the water. But this is a fascinating building, and the Historical Society tried for years to get uh, fish and wildlife, Vermont fish and wildlife, to save it from demolition. There's a superintendent's office up here, which is really something. It's got the old uh, toilet with the uh, wooden tank and the chain pole on it, and the walls are all lathen plaster, and there's a beautiful view from here to across the pond to the, uh, to the trestle. And uh, it's just a, a super building with a tremendous local history that we tried so hard to uh, protect. But a couple of things intervened in time that prevented that from happening. And I'll explain those uh, in a bit. 
So over time, it fell into disuse because it passed from, and uh, I don't say you can quote me, but you can if you want, it passed from federal government hands, where resources seem to be more or less uh, available all the time, to a state possession and control, and it ended up being boarded up and not used except maybe once or twice in the spring when they'd come down and uh, same for fish so they could do a fish count. But here's the attached pump house right here. This is all made out of concrete, this structure. And this structure, of course, is all uh, typical wood construction. It's still standing today. Does the state own it? The state still owns it. This is the side towards the, towards the lake. And this is the famous beach where the spiny soft-shelled turtles reside. And they reside there, and the state tries to protect them from predation by spending a lot of time here uh, taking care of them. And that's good. It's an endangered species, and this is the only known identified site for the spiny soft-shelled turtle. Great building, though. Has it been kept in repair? I mean, are they no. just it fall apart? No, it's falling apart. Yeah, we, uh, we tried. Oh, I can't tell you the number of hours that were spent uh, trying to put things together to make the restoration happen, but it didn't happen. It, and again, I'm going to get to the point where why it didn't happen. Did, did Johnson State College have something to do with that? They did with uh, Fred Wiseman when he was a professor up there. I, I heard they controlled yeah. those buildings. They did at one time. Yeah. They didn't control them, but they had the use of them. Okay. So here you've got, uh, there's the hatchery building, and this is a, a shot from the other side. And there's the pump house that I referred to. And this is the boat barn. This is where boats were uh, stored for the winter. And the nets that the refuge used were stored up here in the, uh, in the open attic. And so here's another view of it. That's the boat barn. There's the hatchery building. And here's a, a portion of the Carmen Marsh right here, which is a WMA, a wildlife management area here in, uh, in West Mountain, Hog Island. And this is where some of the fish pens were too. In fact, if you go there today, you can still find a, a cedar stake or two still in the waters, standing vertically, still there. Did the federal government retain, retain the land? No. They deeded it on condition that it always be used for the propagation of wild fowl. Not wildlife, but wild fowl. Fowl. So the feds... Because of their, their connection with the, the, the state. Rift. But there was nothing in there that so said you had to keep it good repair. Uh, I wish there had been. Yeah. I do. But here's the open end of the boat barn. And the boats were brought up from the river on rails and brought inside uh, for protection and for repair during the winter months. Don, I have the deed to that, and, and I have it here today if you want to take a look at it. If you want to go after them, I'd, I'd help you. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I mentioned, when I was in the Senate, there were little odd parcels of land with strange buildings on it, yeah. and uh, they, they would many times come before the Transportation Committee, and we'd have to send somebody out to assess them, and they'd come back. Yeah. Sometimes they'd mobile it because there was some activity, I think, going on, but anyway. But uh, I'm just surprised that they wouldn't work with someone because I can think of a number of places where basically the state signed off and it's with conditions. So. Well, we went through a couple of commissioners during that period of time, too, from El Hazard and another one, I can't remember his name, but we tried. Um, now, this is a capture boat. This is uh, no longer on site, but it was at the time I took the picture, obviously. This is, um, let's see. This is the boat that I referred to earlier that was used to capture live fish. And it has compartments in it, and it has a way for the water to get, this is a, this is a new twist, a way for the water to get into the boat. <laughs> so you could keep the fish alive while you were moving them to shore to uh, capture their, their eggs and then release them later. But it's a unique boat. 
And uh, again, it's another thing that I, I tried to have saved, but uh, it, it wasn't successful. But there it was uh, back about maybe uh, 15 years ago. Yep. And the Maritime Museum couldn't get that? Pardon? The Maritime Museum couldn't get that? I had people up here from there. What they did was they, they totally sketched it, photographed it, and have all the dimensions in the photograph so they know how to build one if they want to. But they, they didn't, this is why they didn't. Take a look, this is why they didn't want it. Oh, that's the other side. That's the other oh. side of the story. <laughs> yeah, as, as Dan Lynch says, this is the other side of the story. <laughs> and this is John Carmen, one of the last photographs uh, that I know of that were taken of John before he died. And this is, uh, I think this is uh, from Highgate there. Um, no, he was with the wildlife people, the, the fish, fish people. Um, his name will come to me. Dixon. And Dixon, yes, thank you. Yeah, Raymond Dixon. Yeah, Raymond Dixon and the Wally Association too wanted to uh, to get this boat and these buildings uh, saved, and so they took an active role in trying to uh, protect them from from a demolition and also from deterioration. Okay, that's the inside of the main hatchery building. Stuff was just thrown in and piled up. It's got a big uh, furnace in there and, and a nice chimney. There's the furnace and the chimney. Hot water tank. If that's copper. <laughs> Too late, <laughs> If it's copper, it's worth about a thousand. <laughs> really? There used to be an old snowmobile in there. Um, one of the first snowmobiles they ever had, the fish and wildlife bought it. No. Or the pets bought it. It was in there for no years kidding. and years. Steel track. Just being stored? I think stored? it was a Polaris. No kidding. Yeah. Huh. An old, 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 old snowmobile. Every engine was way in the rear. Sniff her up. What do you think, Jim Stowe? Too happy to steal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I won't comment. <laughs> okay, here's the here's the furnace and the pipe to the chimney to the attic. As I told you before, the attic is all finished off, and this is where they did most of the work in here on um, culturing the uh, the fish. And it's been cleaned out. You see uh, the folks from the uh, the uh, fish folks there. Not state employees, but the guys from the association. Sol yeah, thank you. The association, right. Uh, Ray Dixon and, and myself and a few others worked to clean all of this stuff out of here so that we could show the state just how it could look if it was just cleaned up, nothing else. <coughs> but anyway, another story. And so there's Ray again, that's Ray Dixon, and here they are. They've gotten all the stuff out of the buildings that's not worth a thing. And that's my car there. It's not worth a thing. <laughs> and there's the big dumpster. And so, you know, we made an honest effort. But you've heard enough of that. And there's the bonfire. Getting rid of the stuff. And there is the end of the story. That raccoon of mine. <laughs> he stayed too long in one of those bunks upstairs. <laughs> and he didn't hear heed the call to get out. Oh, there he is. He's not there anymore, though. So that's the end of that segment. Just a few more pictures, and then we can chat a little bit. So, Mr. Fournier, this is a picture of Adamir, is it? Adamir Fournier Farm with Adamir in front and Bert Hilliker in the rear, harvesting hay. And the farm back in 1987 was owned by Rennie, still owned by the right? Or not? That's, uh, I recall that, I don't remember when it was totaled, but they 
guy driving is, is it is Merton Helker, Bertie Helker. He lived here on the corner, north of here, on this corner, last corner. That was my father on the back. You remember Orrin Bachelor, of course? <coughs> I, yeah. I think I gave him Orrin that photo. Well, Orrin put the caption on it, and he's got Bert in the back, and your father in the front. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think he's right. Maybe he's not. <laughs> Maybe he's not. I think he's right. Yeah. Well, it's Did your father smoke pipe? Yeah. 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 Well, the one on the back, that is my dad. Dude. Say hi to dad. Dad is going to fight, I remember that, but Burton Helger had a mustache. And no, you don't recognize it there. You don't get that's a good younger day. <laughs> so just, a, just a, an aside, a lot of these pictures we have where you see typewritten captions on them are done by Orrin Batchelder, and he had an amazing collection. Uh, the whole collection uh, was destroyed in the fire in 1970 on Merchant's Row, but he had kept copies and, and then it was re, uh, reproduced and we still have it. But some of the captions are really, uh, they're, they're a treasure. And he took and spent so much time uh, doing it by hand on a, on a hand-driven typewriter. And this is just to show the uh, the, uh, how the legislature in 1935 authorized the uh, construction of this Missisquoi Bay Bridge, which was completed in 1938. And one of the locals who uh, was quite active in getting that to happen was Mr. J. Leo Loisel, who was the Swanton representative at the time, who authorized the governor to appoint a commission with the authority to secure funds for bonding and otherwise, etc. The grand total cost was 559000 financed by a federal grant of 214000 in a bond. Open to the public in 1938, and a few years ago was taken out and replaced by the new bridge that you all enjoy today. You know it was a toll bridge also when it got finished. It was toll. Yeah. yeah. We got the toll house down at the depot. 25 cents, I think, across the month. Yeah, yeah. We have the toll from the toll bridge. Truman Bostwick was one of your yeah. collectors there at one time, too. So you heard about the, the bridge, the, excuse me, the islands in the river. And this picture here is uh, Metcalf Island. And this is an Orrin Bachelor caption. And he later sold it to Sam Webb. You know Sam Webb here, who had a lot of property where he used to hunt geese and whatever, and maybe still does, I don't know, or at least his, uh, his progeny. It's all wildlife refuge now. Is it? Yeah, they had snow mealers back in the day, in the 60s, when snow mealers were just where everybody could own them. My father said, don't you go near that camp at all. You stay away from these, stay off that property. Snow reels went in, burned it. Oh. That's when he sold it to the wildlife property. Yeah. Yeah, there was a building on the other side, and one of the webs was that he was crippled, and they had a walkway all the way out into Long Marsh, and they would carry that guy out there for duck hunting. Mm -hmm. Elevated walkway, because of the floods in the spring and stuff, it, it was above the water. You should have seen it. <laughs> way back in the day. Perseverance. I worked on that in the summer. You did? Yeah. Will she to be the guy? Oh, hey, Warren. Yeah. <laughs> so. Help to make the walkway. So when you're paddling down the river and you pass by uh, Warren Fournier's establishment over here on the right, eventually you come to two islands in the middle, and here's one of them, Metcalf. Middle branch, west branch. Uh, you can paddle on both branches yeah. if you're in a kayak. So anyway, here's Mudget. And here is... Excuse me, that was Metcalf. This is Mudget. This is 1920. Two miles down the river from the other one. Not two miles down the river from the other one, but two miles down the river from the bridge. One time called Jimmery's Island. 
One time owned by Albert Morrell, Henry Letourneau. The camps are still there, on. Are they? They didn't burn them, thank God. But <laughs> <laughs> they're still there. <coughs> we'll go there for refreshments after, okay? <laughs> you can walk to them from the lower landing, you know. I'm uh, down from Louis Land. Now there it is. Now this is, uh, this picture here. Is the Azam Niles Farmhouse, which is next to the it was next to the railroad trestle, uh, one of the, the properties of the Niles family that had so much uh, uh, prime real estate out there. I just thought I'd you'd like to see an old picture of what that's it? one between the railroad tracks and seventy eight. It's no longer there. Oh no, but it was, and this is. Drawbridge. The drawbridge on the trestle, and there is a Charles Alexander, Charlie Alexander, who was the draw keeper, and his wife Amelia. Charlie, Amelia, and I don't know who that is, but look at this uh, little buggy here, hand powered. I'd like to get one of those. Is it that? Is that one up in, uh, behind Taylor Park? They got a handy one, don't they, up there, Ron? In uh, St. Albans? Yeah. Yes, they do. That could yeah. possibly be the one. You never know. Could be. See me. Knowing, knowing Jim Murphy, it could be. That's true. <laughs> yeah. And here's, I believe, our last picture. Yeah, this is just a little close-up of the, of the bridge house, which is still there. This is still there, out in the middle of the uh, of the lake, and it pivots and opens up the trestle for those big Canadian boats to go down through. So that's all I have by way of uh, photographs. It's um, 325. Um, <clears throat> what would you what would you like to talk about now? Ron, would you want some more pictures of the Dixon turkey farm? More turkeys? I got pictures, a lot of pictures. Okay, sure. My grandfather, my grandmother, my grandmother was this high, my grandmother was this high. See, uh, I'm much higher than him. see Linda here, Linda Kelly. She'll take him from here. Yeah, I'll give him to you, Linda. Okay. Yeah. And Mr. Dixon used to raise fox hounds because there had a lot of problems with the turkeys uh, getting eaten by the uh, by the foxes. So my grandfather had foxes, fox hounds to take care of the foxes, and they would also sell the fur. Cool. And then the hawks would come down when the turkeys were this big, you know, mm -hmm. they'd go on a big, big, big wire thing with it when they were small, and they'd put up a big pole on each four corners with a mushrock trap on the top when the hawks landed, that was the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> you, probably, you probably still do that, don't you? No, 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 no. Don't start that. Anything else? Anybody, anybody who hasn't had a chance to put in their two cents, please speak up if you'd like to. This is your great opportunity. Uh, you'll be on TV, but nobody will know who's talking. <laughs> anybody? Yes? Are you going to sell a tape of this? or that, that would be up to uh, Northwest uh, Access TV. They do sell them. I think they're fifteen dollars for a, for a DVD. Yes, and you can you can get it through our wheels. And if you want a a cheaper one, Barry's here. Okay, they're always here as backup. Ron. Yeah. 
you know, on the turkey, you can go back to the Tabor place when Mr. Tabor sold it to Jack Furman. He wouldn't read the same old house. I'm sorry, sorry, I couldn't hear you all. You couldn't didn't hear me? No. Hey, folks, can you? I'm trying to get some valuable information from uh, from Warren here. Tim, trying to get some valuable information. From Mr. Warren. Tabor sold the turkey place to Jack Furman, and there was another one I don't know. I forgot his name. And they raised an awful lot of turkeys. And most of the turkeys then were bought by the United States government for the military. My brother and I used to haul them to Boston. And they were put into barrels with dry ice. And we'd go to Chelsea Mass and load them right on the ships right away to take them on the trucks and ship them to Europe to the military. And then they used to bring the live hen turkeys to Boston in the spring. And I brought the last load when Jack Furman went bankrupt. Hmm. And I brought, I had, I think it was eight or ten ton turkeys on, live turkeys, and I couldn't give them away. <laughs> and the humane seized my truck in Chelsea Mass. <laughs> they put a chain around the clutch to the steering wheel on me, four o'clock at night. And Jack Furman had to get two 55 gallon drums of water, bring it up to the fourth floor of a building in a ton of grain, and they had to carry every one of them turkeys up there and exercise them. <laughs> Before I could get my truck back. <laughs> and Jack Furman told me then, he says, we're bankrupt. He said, we, my brother and he I said, had, we, Warren, did he include you? <laughs> huh? Did he include you when he said we? <laughs> well, his company. Yeah. He says, I'm bankrupt. And he owed us for five loads, I think, but we hauled to Boston that spring. And Warren, he, he said, don't worry, you go to the bank, your money will be there. And by God, he was, a, he was right. Okay. But let me tell you, I don't remember driving back from Boston on that trip. <laughs> Another story. Warren, was that a Another story. Warren. Was, was that the time when you made up the story about putting tar on the turkeys and marching them down? Awesome. I didn't hear you around. Are you the one that started the story about putting tar on the feet of the turkeys and no, marching them? No, I wasn't involved in that. <laughs> Anybody else? This is the fun part. Come on. How often is this church used? Like How often is this church used? Is it like every week? Every, every, Sunday. Every, Sunday. every Sunday in the summertime. And, and you know the bell on this church. As the sign says out front, everybody's welcome, come as you are. Yeah. And it's a it's a great, great church, great service. And we're really uh, indebted to the church and the parishioners for letting us do this program here on a Sunday afternoon. I really appreciate it. Give the church a round of applause. Yeah. The, the, bell, the, bell, the, bell. From the bell in this church comes from the town clerk building in Swanton when that was an academy, a school. You came in late, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and Frank Campbell, there was the one in charge to get that flat, the bell, and they put it up here. I should have known. It would have been a Campbell from Hog Island that would get that bell and put it up there. Yeah. Uh, I want to tell you, when we get the tower back on Town Hall, we want the bell back. <laughs> I don't think they'll give you this back. <laughs> no, it, it gets good use. I mean, I was here the other day on Sunday when the services were being announced, and it, it's nice. It's nice yeah. to hear it. Yeah. It's a nice artifact. It's much better to be using it than have it just sit somewhere without being used. How about it? Anybody else? Yes. Yes. Why was it called Hog Island instead of Turkey Island? <laughs> no one ever suggested Turkey Island. I don't know. Yeah. I was told they put the far. hogs on the island to get rid of the snakes. Yeah, there's a lot of snakes. <laughs> hogs got rid of the snakes. Good. And that's how they, they named it Hog Island. Yeah. Here you go. Yeah, they used to have fish on. No, this, this is priceless. This is folklore. 
Anybody else? Okay, well, I want to thank you all. You've been a great audience. I've really enjoyed your participation in this program. It's made it a very special one for me and for the people in the Swanton Historical Society. And we, we appreciate your heritage, which is also ours. Thank you very much. Thank you.